guess that's the cue that we're set to start. Um, welcome everyone, I have a script, so let's go through it. We would like to welcome you to the session of the Open Book Festival, which is fabulous, so thank you for being here. And on stage, we, I, am delighted to have Karen Dolly, author of The Enforcers. All the books on this panel were published this year, published by Donald the Ball. It's a real sweep across Cape Town from Cafe Caprice to the Cape Flats, from uh, Serbia to Johannesburg, uh, really a riveting read, terrifying as well, and much of it actually takes place right around the Fugard. <laughs> now, we'll get into that. Uh, then next we have Futa Kreha, a esteemed South African journalist, almost 40 years in the profession, recently retired, I understand, as of the last three months, and also recently at the State Capture Inquiry too. He is the author of the SABC 8, uh, which of course features him and colleagues on the cover, published 2019 as well, by Penguin. Uh, all of these books are on sale uh, for the end of the show if you haven't got them yet. And then finally, Peter Louis Mayberg, 2019, Gangster State, aptly titled a, a cross-section of political players in the free state we'll get into shortly, and also published by Penguin. So that's the panel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the nerves will subside shortly for all on stage, I'm sure. I'm Erin Bates, I'm a freelance journalist, previously with ENCA, so I'm in good company uh, with fellow journalists. And we've been mandated, uh, tasked with talking about um, shocking experiences chasing the truth. And unfortunately, I don't have to answer a question on that one. Uh, but certainly in your truth-finding and fact-finding missions and all of these books, there must have been shocking moments. Um, there are shocking moments in each of your books. Um, Karen, just for you, if you think about the process of writing The Enforcers, a shocking moment that you can recall? I know there was a very tumultuous auction scene in the book. Anything that comes to mind? Um, I try not to think about writing it. Um, I think the most shocking thing happened before the writing process, and that was a death threat for writing about a national gun smuggling investigation. Yeah, which is included in the book. Yes. Uh, there is also, is that Operation Urchis? Because there, there are a number of operations that you mention in the book. One thing is... That was codenamed Project MP and it looked into firearms meant to be in police custody ending up in the hands of gangsters around the Western Cape. Sure. Uh, Futa, for you, I know there's a moment in the book where you talk about leaving the institution you worked at for decades, but there's also obviously the very poignant and gripping tale of what happened to Suna Fenter. Uh, what's, what's the most shocking moment in finding the truth of your story? I think uh, our story was a, a sort of a slow-moving chess game. Mm. Uh, I think my first chapter started with me running up a, a novel copies to go and untie Suna who was tied up to a tree and uh, felt around her uh, was sitting <coughs> At that stage, I was sat, uh, in, uh, in overdrive. I didn't realize the consequences. I, uh, my family was so mad with me for a month later. And, uh, but if I read the book now, I can see there was a lot of tension building up. Uh, death threats. I received about 14 death threats. Uh, soon now, about 16 or 17, my other uh, SABC colleagues. Uh, 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 received a couple of uh, lawyer, Asa Musaji received some. And uh, yeah, it's difficult to pinpoint a specific moment, but I think the most dramatic one was maybe in chapter one, where, where uh, I received a phone call very early in the morning, about just before four, uh, from a colleague uh, and a friend. Yeah. And in the book, you speak about checking in with one another because of your concerns over safety, that yeah. Suna would let you know at night and in the morning what her movements were. Yeah. Do you think you were a bit sort of numb to what actually was sort of closing in on you, that you were kind of in survival mode as a group? Yeah, I, I think, uh, according to my family, I, uh, I'm a bit numb. Um, uh, both my uh, partner and my daughter uh, they were um, uh, diagnosed with PTSD afterwards and they had to uh, receive treatment and I think that it's still uh, sort of in the background at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're doing the round, so I'm yeah. so you know you're next. <laughs> but I think um, there's very little to the Chris Mahashile story that is not shocking. Um, what, what really sort of just 
kicks you in the teeth in an, on an ongoing basis while researching something like as Mahashiva's handling of government affairs is the, the absolute raw disregard for the, the well-being of the people they're supposed to serve. You know, and that really um, becomes manifest in these, these case studies that allows me to show how corruption impacts on poor people, really. So there's a couple of cases, and, and I go into some detail in this in the book, where RDP projects, for instance, in the free state, was absolutely captured and utilized as a looting opportunity for Asma Hashidi and his family and connected business people. And the, you know, the, the culmination of that is people ending up with no houses or leaking roofs or toilets that don't work or all finished houses. You know? So just time and time again, to you know, get like a, a sort of a visceral sense almost of what corruption really means on the ground for, for poor people, people was very shocking because you know I think maybe for a while we especially in the the Gupta kind of state capture iteration, you know, state capture was associated with these kind of complex money laundering flows and large financial transactions, advisory transactions of transit and and this coming. I think really the, the Ace Mahashule manifestation of state capture was was really, you know, allowed you a window on the impact of corruption on poor people, you know. Estina is, is a well-known case, and then all these other cases that I, um, you know, it's exposed in the free state along with that one. Yes, and your book does have such thorough research into a number of different fraudulent and uh, irregular contracts in the free state. There's the asbestos project, there's the housing scheme, there's Estina. But of course, the opening chapter, much like in Futa's book, your opening chapter is something out of a crime film. Yeah, so that would be the assassination of Igor Bombani. Um, he's a business person who had gotten a 255 million rand asbestos audit contract. So that's essentially counting asbestos roofs. And they flushed a quarter of a billion rand out of the preset department of human settlements in a very short period of time. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of rolling out this contract, Bombani was assassinated in Sandin in June 2017 while driving a 1 million rand binky and also having 1 million rand in cash in his car. Including um, in a freezer or a cooler bag. Yes, so the 500,000 rand was in a pick and pay cooler bag next to him. It actually had the word uh, goodness on the side of it, quite ironic. Um, and you know, some Bombani was on his way to the free state and that's one tiny link um, to Jais Mahashiri, but then you know the, the crux of that, that part of the book revolves around what I call the ego files. So it's leaked documents from Bambani's businesses, you know, his email server that shows that Ace Mahashule directly um, benefited from this corrupt deal and actually siphoned off some of the monies along with ego and Bambani. And that's ego, I G O, not E G O. But talking about egos, uh, Claudi Motsuneng is a key character in your book on what happened at the National Broadcaster. Cult of personalities, it's quite a strong theme, wielding a fiefdom, effectively, that comes across in all of your books in unique ways. What are your experiences working with them? I know they're sort of detailed at length in the book, but for those who are going to buy it after this fabulous talk. <laughs> um, yeah, Stavi Moksunen is a funny character. Uh, fortunately, I did not have to speak to him uh, often, but he mostly spoke uh, spoke. Speak, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And uh, it was actually fascinating uh, doing some research on him. And I listened to a lot of uh, uh, of audio recordings of his speech. And it was so easy. All you have to do is just to uh, write about Cloudy according to Cloudy, mm -hmm. because there's so much uh, of what he said. And uh, yeah, it, it, sometimes you feel sorry for the guy uh, because. Uh, you don't know if he understand uh, how he's perceived uh, from the outside. Um, yeah, uh, but I think closer to uh, May 2016, when I was called up to his uh, to his uh, office on, on the 27th floor, I realised that this man is really dangerous. And uh, listening to the to the Zonda Commission this week also, how uh, the previous CEO thought he was awesome, and everyone around him thought he was awesome, and I could never understand that. Even in the newsroom, people would be uh, glued to the TVs when he's, and they would laugh, and uh, and but no one, not one of the people inside the newsroom, actually created what he said was law. 
I think uh, Tandeka Kubule and Levi Yesler also say that, and my, my colleague Trivani, um, that uh, it's incomprehensible to, to understand how intelligent people, journalists, auditors, HR people, was in awe with, with, with a guy like Motsune. He was also more than just a great and gripping orator, but someone who wielded so much control over the national broadcaster. Um, Karen, I want to come to you talking about elections. There's an interesting section in your book about a meeting at the president's residency in South Africa just before a significant election. I think it was 2016. And the overlap between gangsterism and the fight for a bouncer kind of turf in the CBD and uh, meetings with the then head of state. I think it was early. Was it early? Three years early. Okay. I can't pinpoint exactly right now. But yes, there were allegations from various sources that some of the Western Cape's most high profile suspected gang bosses met with the then President Jacob Zuma and that Mr. Zuma's son, Dudizane, sort of helped facilitate this meeting. I recall one of the details that isn't in the book is that they first met somewhere in Woodstock, sort of very close to town. They were all told to throw their cell phones into a bag of sorts and then they went on. Um, it's interesting because those links seem, or they have persisted. Um, in 2017, Nafiz Modak, who is allegedly heading a group that has recently tried to sort of grab power of nightclub security operations. He was photographed in the one and only hotel with Duduzane Zuma. And when I interviewed Mr. Modak prior to that photograph, he told me during the interview that he provides protection to Duduzane when Duduzane is in Cape Town. And I mean, what a suspected criminal is doing providing protection to the then president's son <laughs> but um, you also cite Modak saying that he just calls himself a businessman. This uh, thing of people in business, it's your book quite significantly, it comes up in Pippa Louis book as well in a different province in a different context, but how far does that kind of argument go? Everything's about board, we're just providing security for a bunch of nightclubs on one of the most lucrative streets in the city when it comes to the partying scene. It's all kosher. Um, it's often, I'm just a businessman or I'm an ordinary businessman. I've heard that so many times that it's at the point when I hear it now, I'm immediately like, oh, if you're pointing that out, <laughs> any that's not something <laughs> necessary. <Yeah. to> <laughs> it's just us, uh, like saying, I'm just a politician. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's something I've heard several times. Um, the, the pity when it comes to that is, at the moment, Mr. Modak is just a businessman. He has not been convicted of anything. He is not a criminal in the eyes of the state. He is on trial. Um, the same goes for another suspected or one time suspected gang boss, Jerome Donkey Boyson. He is or was alleged to hit the Sexy Boys gang, which is a very notorious gang known for murders and drug smuggling. He also says he's just a businessman. And despite being previously named in court as a suspect in one of the biggest underworld murders in the Western Cape, which is still unsolved officially, he is, yeah, just a businessman. Just just a businessman. I mean, Peter Louis, in your book, there are a lot of businessmen, some businesswomen as well, who either have links to government officials or uh, history with government officials prior to their rise in politics. It's such a thorough read that it's hard uh, sitting here now with all of these books in my head to pull out the threads. But that issue of the relationship between the free state government and contracts with service providers and outside business is so convoluted and tainted. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you know these are very useful case studies to help us understand how state capture is actually implemented. And, and, and to compare it, I think they are sort of you know subsets or subgenres, different models of state capture. Now I think in the in the Jacob Zuma model for instance, the, there was a situation where I think to a large degree, you know, especially Jacob Zuma and the Gupta's Nexus, they were the, the, the tail that wagged the dog almost. You know, mm -hmm. I think they had control over Jacob Zuma for some reason, you know, to the extent that you know, they, they, they could summon him to Saxon world and have him, you know, carry out orders in terms of hiring and firing key people in government. 
Interestingly enough, in, in the, I think in the in Esma Ashila space, it, it sometimes was the other way around. You know, obviously there's a lot of uh, cross pollination almost. You know, in the two models, so Guptas do come into the the free state fray. But Esma Hashile had, had kicked off or had put in place his own state capture net, uh, networks long before the Guptas arrived on the scene. And you know, that's where these kind of business people, you know, come to the fore or come into play. You know, he's got a collection of associates, business associates. Some of them work with him in the provincial government before he became a premier, um, who then, you know, on an ongoing basis, year after year, you know, reap these lucrative, uh, lucrative contracts from key departments in government through corrupt tenders, you know, and we can say corrupt because a, a body like the Auditor General, for instance, you know, year after year, time after time, they, um, you know, they, they carry out audits on those contracts and make adverse findings in terms of, you know, uh, the, the sidestepping or flouting of the dinner regulations. So there's just a, a very interesting set of individuals, um, his own capture network, and then later on he also starts to insert his own family into these teams um, prominently, or, um, you know, he says his daughter, Tokumondemne, is one of the foremost benefactors of, of deals that he directly uh, engineers uh, to, to her benefit. And then, of course, his sons are also involved in some of these teams. Quick question. Do you think the ANC Secretary General, Ace Mahashile, who has dodged all of the thorough investigations you've done into graft in the Free State, although I know he is ostensibly going to take you to court? Probably so. How's that going? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm becoming quite concerned with legal law because he's been in consultation with his lawyers for a good uh, six or seven months now. <laughs> and we all know what legal fees uh, entail. So there, there's, no, the yeah, there's, no, there's no indication of a summons from Mahashiri at this point. Um, it would, you know, the, the kind of the legal ramifications of that would be that it really actually opens him up and makes him vulnerable legally because there's a whole process whereby the, somebody who defends themselves against a defamation suit can file for what they call discovery. So my legal team can say, okay, well, in order to defend myself against this defamation suit, I need these emails and bank records and so on just to kind of just to, to um, prove that, you know, possibly um, what he's saying or his, his defamation claims are, are not correct. And he's not willing to take that step. What he has done, there are two individuals who feature as uh, characters in the book, Mahashiri Associates, who have sued for defamation. Those are ongoing cases and Yes, it's it's not cases that are keeping my lawyers up at night. Let's just put it at that. So, the yeah. quick question is: Do you think he has ambitions to be head of state? I think he did. I think he did. I think so. I think our politics changes and shifts so so quickly. Um, was it Harold Wilson, former British Prime Minister, who said a week in politics is a long time? In South Africa, a day in politics sometimes is a really a long time. Um, Mahashile had a power base, especially at the start of his tenure as SGE, and that, that is very quickly by the looks of it seems to uh, seemingly eroded to, uh, to a degree. And, and you, can, you can see that in certain developments during the year, you know, when he was um, very directly reprimanded, you know, by Ramaphosa for remarks around the nationalization of the Reserve Bank. There was no real rallying around the office of the SG, um, really. I think he, he possibly made a strategic mistake by becoming SG and not staying on in the free state. Um, because I think largely it was a provincial power base. It was one that uh, was f obviously fed into and was propped up by the, um, the, the Premier League bloc. You know, him and Sipra Momopelo and Didi Mabuza, of course. And I think that's, that's largely sort of eroded and it seems to be in an increasing way um, to be isolated politically. Uh, Futa, we were talking about um, litigation. The whole issue of court cases and trying to bring to account the people at the SABC who'd clamped down on you and your colleagues who spoke out against the embargo on protest coverage before the 2016 elections. That's key to the early part of your book. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, what brought the eight of you together. How surprised were you at the sort of rallying of that group? Um, yeah, uh, I was listening to Tandeka Kubur and Becky yesterday uh, while uh, talking to the Zonda Commission. And uh, we had a discussion the, couple, uh, the last couple of months about the SABC aid as such, and the way we uh, we were we came together uh, yesterday when we, uh, we and um, Lucanio Calato was was on stage. 
the two of us also discussed the fact that we were actually isolated in Cape Town, we were busy there, there were different groupings, uh, different unions, uh, and, so, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 and even up to our, our labor court meet, uh, uh, case, uh, we were different groups. Although the media labeled us as the SABCH, it was only after that where we um, tried to get direct access to the constitutional court, where we as a group started to work together, sit together, sit hours and hours. We sat hours and hours at the lawyers' offices drinking cappuccino, eating the cookies, and listening to, to all the advice coming in. Um, yeah, um, but it, it, I think it's, it's not, we are not, uh, we have never been in one room all act together. Mm. Um, but you are on WhatsApp quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we had a WhatsApp group, yeah, yeah. Uh, where we discussed a lot of things. And I think those are some of the most interesting moments because, in a, in a way, your book reads like a supplemented diary or maybe a, a letter to friends. It, it felt to me in the kind of texture of the book. And there are these dialogues between the SABCA chipping in all hours of the day and night, uh, Lucanio Talata and Cape Town sort of providing support and encouragement, Krivani Pele, feedback, uh, Tandeka Kobule as well, this incredible kind of disparate group that's sort of gotten together from different corridors of the SABC. Yeah, and yeah. It, it does supplement the book. Yeah, uh, I think I brought that in uh, because essentially the SABC, uh, the SABCA battle has been fought in courts and in, in, in legal rooms and so on and a lot of corris uh, correspondence and if you just read that I think it can be a very boring process yeah. if you're not into the legal and, and uh, terms and, and, and the legal procedure. So what I try to do is to write the book in such a way to bring the human aspect uh, to the front and to give the people their own voices to, to, uh, to speak uh, and to tell their story in a, in a specific way. Yeah. I think if Futa's book reads like a kind of diary, on my reading anyway, Karen, your book reads like a thriller. Uh, and it was, there were moments where I could sort of recall people like Yuri the Russian Yudiansky and go, I remember news reports about him, what did he look like? And then, you know, going down an internet rabbit hole uh, or looking up Cyril Bierke and all of that. Um, how was compiling all of it, drawing on your previous journalism and, and maybe meeting again with sources to collate the text? That was without a doubt the hardest part because what I try to do is to protect myself. Um, I'm not making allegations against anyone. I'm not in a position to do so. I am not in the underworld. I used mostly court documents, court testimony, direct words from figures that I focus on, who I focused on. And yeah, it's, it was, it's a lot of work. <laughs> the book turned out to be kind of like a sort of run through of my career. So basically when I started out, I was looking into gangsterism, crime, um, much more broadly and then after Cyril Beaker's murder in 2011, this one individual approached me, I interviewed him, didn't think much of it at the time, it turned out to be a suspected underworld figure, Yuri the Russian's apparent best friend, and he gave his input on the nightclub security scene. And then after that I started looking into politics in Cape Town, policing, and all of a sudden I realized that it's all horrifically interconnected and trying to make those connections outside of my mind and putting it into concise sentences was exceptionally difficult. But it, it reads uh, incredibly well and kind of pulls you through as a reader. Um, I think one of the key parts is where you start to deal with police and the political intrapersonal dynamics of what's going on in the police, the fighting, uh, the different regimes and leaders and uh, key figures that are, we understand, clamping down on gangsterism or supposed to be, but may also be embroiled in what's going on. Did you kind of clarify whether some of those key figures were definitely on the one side or the other, or did it just turn into mud? 
Well, that is still ongoing. So we've got different factions within police. That is with the Western Capes, head of the NPA at the moment, to see if they are going to prosecute certain police officers. So their claims, one group of police officers decided with one side of the alleged underworld and the, yeah, there's a second grouping up against this grouping and this grouping claims, no, these guys are actually sided with the other side of the underworld. So it's exceptionally murky, but I do think that that is the intention to create the murkiness so we can't pinpoint who is truly wrong or criminal. Yeah. Is there a grouping who's merely doing law enforcement work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's possible because when, you, when claims are made against you, you have to defend yourself, especially with police officers. You can't simply be um, labelled a murderer, for instance while you are trying to incarcerate murderers. So you have to deal with that, and that obviously detracts from your boots on the ground job. I, I think it's incredible, uh, impossible to work at the organization where you don't know where, where they sides. And I experienced that at the SABC also, when you, when you walk into a newsroom filled with managers, and you know the next day you get a, a, a death threat describing the clothes yes. that someone had on. And your movements. Yeah, your or you're going country. to Cape Town and uh, the SABC travel uh, mm -hmm. office or book flights and then you get a death threat saying, ah, oh, see, you're going to Cape Town now. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Or your Gmails. Uh, uh, so, so you don't know who to trust anymore. You don't know if HR is in your site. Especially after they walked you out of the building, and, and uh, probably not. No. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, so I think it's the same also if you uh, in, a, in the police force, where you don't know who 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 sides who who's who. Yeah. And you profile the different groupings in the SABC dealing with this very um, difficult, tense, uh, politicized environment where the stakes are so high and people are fearful. Uh, and also trying to do a job at the biggest uh, news outlet in the country, perhaps in many cases, as you say in the book, the only source of news for many South Africans. Mm -hmm. So there's the people who are fully on board with the kind of capture project, and then there are the people who are against it but meek, and you, you divide it up. But, but I thought what was quite interesting is when you speak about having been put on suspension but not yet um, expelled, and that you were quite... Uh, you showed quite a lot of solidarity with people who remained behind and sort of kept the fires <coughs> burning. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important uh, for people to to stay behind and to... But uh, there's, there's actually only two ways. Either that you speak out and, and there's the possibility that they, uh, they fire or dismiss you, or you stay behind, keep quiet, but still doing uh, your job. In my uh, case, my, my team uh, was very brave in trying to reflect what's actually happening within the SABC. Uh, I think much more than a lot of other uh, radio stations current affairs programs. Uh, so yes, um, I felt sorry for them. Uh, because there were a tremendous uh, lot of pressure, especially after we, uh, we got dismissed. People didn't know what, what was going to happen. <laughs> and especially Slavi who came out and say, uh, said to Simon Tegeli, uh, get rid of them if they do not uh, comply, just get rid of them. If, if they do not follow instructions, get rid of them. And Jimmy Matthews who said, yeah, you know, it's cold outside, you, you can go uh, door, either window. door or the window. Yeah. And then he chose the door. And you walked out of the place, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's incredible difficult in in uh, to work in a place like that. After Jimmy Matthews left, which was not long after the SABC three, four, eight story kind of emerged, uh, he spoke out about the tenure he'd held at the SABC. But it also comes across as quite problematic in your book. Do you harbour um, sort of scepticism about his take? post facto or is there compassion for what he was dealing with and the idea that he was trying to mitigate the chaos or a bit of both or something else? Um, someone, uh, uh, one of the uh, well-known political analysts whatsapp me this morning and asked about Jimmy Matthews and I said to him, Jimmy had a, had a chance to speak out 
after his resignation, he was one or two shows, and then we asked him to uh, uh, to fill in, uh, out an affidavit for our constitutional court case. He did not do that. He promised soon enough to do that. He would have uh, come involved, but he did not. Then there uh, was that hot committee in Parliament where he was invited. He didn't want to participate. Then we had the Joe Smollo, uh, uh investigation into interference he did not. and now as on the commission he was invited or he asked to appear he offered an affidavit where he attacked me saying that the fact that I queried uh, illegal instruction that it was because I'm a white man and I had a black uh, woman as a line manager so he, he tried to to circumvent the, the, the fact that I was called to his office because I refused to not uh, to not to reflect the EFF's um, uh, 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 campaigning, campaigning yeah. in, in, uh, on our uh, on our shows. So that was the issue, not the fact that I had a black uh, line manager who. Uh, who was involved with Asma Bashula many, many years ago. That's a very interesting link also where I was listening to you. There was a time when Asma Bashula was on radio every day on the city. And the guy, uh, 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 there, there are rumors that Charlie mm -hmm. Motonen, who was then a young reporter, had a, he had a direct line to him. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from Kwakwa and Eastern Free Center, there are long, long run yeah, yeah. ties between those two. There is also an interesting overlap in your two books because some of the most senior people at the SABC during this time of crisis, really, around the 2016 election and beyond, who uh, come up in your book. Uh, so, Motsuneng, Zizi uh, Godwa, Zizi Godwa's comments on what had happened with the SABC, your information about an alleged payback to Zizi Godwa not proven at this point, and there's a lot of evidence of the chain if there is one missing. Uh, but I found that quite interesting in the relationship between the free state and political heavyweights in the free state mm -hmm. and Gauteng. Yeah, absolutely. And it's quite interesting how a lot of that sort of occurred within the SABC environment, really. So, so state capture really happens on, you know, multiple legs. You know, you've got the, the corporate sphere of state capture, the corporate sort of, you know, the literally the capture of the fiscus and you know siphoning off rents and large contracts towards particular areas. But then there's all sorts of other things that need to fall in place in order to protect that duty. You know, and that involves weakening the um, you know the law enforcement environment, definitely hollowing out the walls in the NBA. But then media capture, which is something that I delve into in Gangster State, needs to occur because you continuously uh, you continuously have to mold the public perception about your government and, and about your dealings and literally broadcast propaganda. So I, I do write about Ace Mahashira's dealings within the SABC environment, how he literally um, at, at, at points in time dictated to the, the local office, um, the SABC's Bloemfontein office, in terms of what they could cover and what they couldn't cover, with really sort of a very strong grip on the media coverage. That's a public broadcast there. He didn't stop there. They completely decimated a uh, private, uh, a, a publicly, uh, privately owned newspaper called the Free State Times, which had actually started to pretty thorough investigative work in the province. It was owned by Zimbabwe and the media entrepreneurs. And Mahashile, uh, they centralized the, the ad buying muscle of the provincial government, I call it, they captured it, and they diverted much needed ad revenue away from them to a blatantly pro-Mahashile propagandistic a publication called the Free State, um, Free State Times, uh, the Weekly, apologies. So the Weekly and the Free State Times had these kind of media battles and that newspaper, the Free State Times, closed down right after they started to really get into the, you know, the heart of the matter as much as she was capturing the Free State. And then, of course, also coming into the picture is the Gupta's and U.S. newspaper, which got its first major government subscriptions in the Free State before it was rolled out nationally. Do you think there's a manual uh, State Capture 101? I should actually be curious about this sort of the, you know, the manuals I leave behind in the form of these books because that essentially is a yeah. State Capture 101. No, uh, be, because when uh, the Zonda Commission approached us initially, I thought, but what the hell they said, we see, uh, why investigate them? Mm -hmm. 
And then they explained to me that they're looking at specific role players that picture all uh, over the whole state capture. Sure. Uh, yeah. And there's a link, and they try to to put a puzzle together and see how this actually happened and uh, how did it go. Yeah, I think we'd be, be astounded once we actually stand back and see how vast this puzzle really is, how sort of it incorporates from Transit, ESCOM, the SOEs, the now the money was to the propaganda on the SABC to the MPA and the Hawks and the, the deliberate collapse of the Scorpions before the Hawks, how that, that whole picture was a deliberate strategy to, to capture this country. Who is the brain behind all this? I think there, there's a collection of brains, I think, but obviously, you know, Jacob Zuma was at the center of in terms of the executive arm of government, mm. along with private sector captains. Uh, what is interesting is I've seen copies of your book in the hands of some of the legal team at the State Capture Inquiry, littered with uh, notes and tabs. Uh, I suspect they've been looking at your book quite thoroughly as well, based on the SABC evidence we've seen, including yours. And Karen, I suspect it might just be a matter of time before your book makes it uh, to the legal team too. And the reason is because there is a very clear overlap between organized crime or alleged organized criminals in the Cape, working specifically around security services, and there's a double meaning in that whole idea, and the ANC. You, you deal with the kind of two jackets that people wear, the kind of bouncer security boss jacket and then the ANC often leather jacket that people wear. Well, that quite literally actually, in court one day, I think it was in 2017 or 2018, Nafiz Modak, who is accused of extortion, <coughs> he's accused of basically strong arming or forcing restaurant and nightclub owners to use his security outfit or his security outfit linked to him. He actually appeared in the dock one day with a nice, nice fitted blue jacket with the NC logo on the left side of his chest. So, yeah, they really, some of them are very blatant about it. And there is also the idea of the Father Christmas Robin Hood. So, uh, the two brothers in your book who are both involved in organized crime and are at times sort of friendly and at other times opposed. What is the surname again? Uh, you may be referring to the Boyson brothers? Yes, I think so. Um, where was I going with this? I don't remember. <laughs> it's okay, I think I can answer this. Yes, so tell me. <laughs> 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 um, no, there is actually something quite horrific in this, and I'm not going to use the Boysen brothers because they are similar of age and the one is actively on trial and accused of a second murder and the other isn't actually on trial or anything at the moment. <coughs> I'm going to go with the Stanfield family. So in the yes. 90s we had Colin Stanfield, he was an allegedly, he was a gang boss, he's dead, so there's no defamation here. So, he was a gang boss. He had a, an outfit, a racket called The Firm, and he was heavily involved in pumping Cape Town full of Mandrax, which was coming all the way from India, and he was working with international crime suspects. He was never convicted. At his funeral, which was in Valhalla Park, um, people lamented the fact that he died. He died of cancer of sorts, natural causes, and it's gutting, but what he did was that he gave out cash, he, he listened to people's issues in that community, and it's fast forward to about three, four years ago, Colin Stanfield's nephew, Ralph Stanfield, who's been arrested for allegedly getting firearm licenses illegally from police officers in Pretoria, he was photographed handing out wads of cash to residents in, I think, Bishop Levis. So, there is that Robin Hood effect. It looks at um, people, and you can't really blame people if you need money, if you need protection, and you get it from not the state, if you aren't getting a job. It's, it's a very blurry area. That is exactly the anecdote I was getting to, so thank you for saying to me. <laughs> but handing out cash leads us back to one Ace Maha Shule, which is before the election. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. You know, there's, there's um, these deliberate attempts to, to constantly portray yourself as a man of the people mm -hmm. on Maha Shule's behalf. And I think that's a common thread that, that really is sort of present in all government gangsters. Um, and it really sort of resembles what happens on the street level, on the street level. So, yeah, there's, there's always this image that comes back to my mind. There's a movie called American Gangster, which is based on a true story where you know, the lead character is uh, you know, a former boss, hands out these meat parcels Christmas time to a community who they ravage 
by importing heroin and selling it to that community. It's basically a true story. And it's a very similar sort of model in the South African context. And even so for polit politicians, you know, the Jacob Zumas and the Ace Mahashiris, you know, they for years very successfully and, and very craftily managed to portray themselves as, you know, um, men of the people, leaders of the people. So they would be actively involved in these projects. Ace Mahashir had something called Operation Shlasela which involved handing out a couple of bursaries here or maybe donating a house here and there. But, but what, what is hidden from plain sight beneath all of that is a very rife looting system that, that is to the detriment of m much, much more people than a couple of uh, um, individuals who benefit from bursaries and benefit from RDP houses. You know, the massive failed RDP projects that sees hundreds of millions of rands siphon off to his own family members and people connected to him. It, it, it really then is, it becomes glaringly at odds, um, you know, this portrayal of oneself as someone who's pro poor or who's pro people. You know, there's so many instances of, of, of that that I tackle in the book. Yes. Uh, I think in order to capture capture, you must give. And the same happened that they said, you see, with yes. Raimond Sonne, uh, they were uh, both a parity exercise where uh, people in my office came to me and said, listen, I've just received 36,000 pound payback and my, my salary scale has improved by two or three uh, levels. And they were obviously very happy, but the people who did not receive that was not so happy. Yeah. But we're not so happy. And then he dished out that 50,000 50, to all the uh, to all the musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got his praise song yeah. as and, well. And, and yeah. even just, uh, just before he left, he, he called it sweetness. Mm -hmm. He dished out sweetness, uh, 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 10,000 to every, uh, everyone on a certain scale. And uh, by that he also captured the CWU, the one, uh, one union. Mm -hmm. And every time there was a, a protest march, out, march outside the SNDC, the CWU were, were there with their old uh, cardboard posters saying, Slurry, we love you, Slurry, we love you. Mm -hmm. And it's a fact that he used money, I don't know where he got it from, uh, sometimes within the institution in a certain sense, um, and, and dished it out to people to buy support in order to... Centralize the power, really. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same SABC that's been beleaguered by financial problems, yeah. you know, yeah. since his time. I remember uh, when uh, I did not receive the suite at the 10,000, but, but soon I did, she was on a lower scale, and she wrote to, um, to HR and said, listen, I don't want this money, it's, it's bribery, mm -hmm. and can I give it back? And they were flabbergasted, they didn't know what to do because there's no mechanism to give money back then. That's why they gave you. But that is interesting because it's a state institution, and state institutions or provincial institutions being used as a form of allowing for kickbacks or sweeteners comes up quite strongly in your book too. You wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to say on a street level, or a street level, what I notice is that if you are arrested for a crime at some point. You have to apply for bail. It looks incredibly wonderful during a bail application when you've got statements from the residents saying this person is an upstanding individual. Please do not keep him in custody. We need this in our community. Um, when you've got you running feeding schemes, etc., NGOs, and you've got the paperwork, it looks brilliant on paper during a bail application. How do you tip? Thanks. <laughs> Hopefully none of us are going to be there or have used that tip before. Um, we're, we're wrapping up. I have one final question amongst all my notes. Uh, and then I think we'll open it up to the floor uh, for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the question is around the most difficult element of writing your book. The theme of this talk is dirty, dirty politics, which is a kind of unnecessary adjective, as we discussed before you all came in. You just say politics, probably. Um, but uh, what, I mean, uh, you, for example, Peter Louis, you did so much research on this book. It's incredibly thorough. You deal with a number of really flagrantly problematic, unlawful contracts in the free state. But what was the most, was it wading through the documents? What, what element of the book was the most challenging for you? Yeah, I, th I think what is challenging and what, what is very important to, you know, to, to pull off successfully is to, to transform these, what are essentially sort of cold, boring, dead documents into digestible stories. Um, and that is where, you know, I think this book was a great opportunity to do that. I think frequently, and this is, you know, self-criticism, you know, towards investigative journalism maybe, is that 
we, we get very sort of bogged down in the intricate financial dealings and the money laundering and the front companies, whilst possibly forgetting that there's a, very, a, a real human cost to all of this. That is what was great for me during the chapters, you know, to, to really display how, yes, on the one hand, there, there's this uh, really complex, sometimes looting system at play where, you know, money siphoned off the front companies, but I could then go and compare that to the project, the ODP project on the, on the ground, for instance, where poor people aren't getting their houses. I could further elaborate on the Stina project, for instance, where, you know, there's this complex, once again, international money laundering system, money is flushed out of the Free State Department of Agriculture to Hong Kong, to Dubai, and then back to South Africa to help uh, pay for the wedding. But there's also uh, about a hundred would-be emerging farmers in the Frieda area who now were um, bereft from or were, were, were robbed of an opportunity to partake in what could have been a life-changing opportunity to, for the, themselves and their families to become successful farmers eventually. So I think that that was a challenge in that always to keep that in mind that is on the one hand you know, some of these investigative you know forensic elements of the stories are quite complex and there's a there's a, um, a risk that one could lose um, you know for some readers and now that I'd like to bring it back into a more digestible um, almost visceral um, a portrayal of what what corruption really means. Well, as a quick punt, there's a fabulous bit about the Cayman Islands about three quarters of the way through the book, so that's, that's a good reason to keep wading through, and I think you do achieve that to, to a great degree. Fuka, obviously, I mean, the relationship with your colleagues, Suna Fenter's own story, her health issues, and the stresses of what you all went through must have been quite key, but... What was the most challenging aspect of, of putting this piece together? I know you're, you're hoping to do a nice trip and take a break from all the book stuff soon, so... Yeah, I think the problem with my book, uh, that's different from the two of them. I was part of, uh, yeah. of the story, and we know there's a rule in journalism, you, uh, you do not become part of the story. It was not my fault. I mean, I was picked up, uh, so I, I had no that's choice. A, that's a bite right there. Uh, and, and, and then, um, for me, I think it was the emotional uh, reliving of what happened. You know, a phone call, quarter to nine at one uh, Saturday night, Suna crying, saying they shot at her, and I tried to direct her to her house, and she collapsed in, in Madeleine's arms. And uh, uh, to relive that and that emotions was, was uh, quite difficult for me. Um, and yeah, even listening to Tandeka yesterday at the Zona Commission, and I realized the trauma that you sometimes you try to distance yourself from even your colleagues and your close friends. And, and when you look at it, you see what happened to you, and the paranoia and, and, and the difficulty of distinguishing between fact and, 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 and uh, fiction. Uh, you know, um, we uh, interviewed an uh, old security policeman uh, during the dirty tricks uh, of the uh, apartheid time. And he said the easiest thing to do if you want to get rid of someone, just follow them. Put on the glasses, just follow them. You don't have to do anything. Two or three days and they will disappear, they will go away. And I think what happened in, in, in my book, uh, to understand that there's a break-in in your house at the same time when Suna's flat was trashed and a break-in at Uzi. Is there a link or not? You don't know. But it has the effect of a link, the, even if the there isn't. Effect, there's a definite effect. And I think when I, uh, when I listened to Tandeka uh, yesterday, I could see the same thing. You, you do not know what was real, what was not? Was it uh, a deliberate attempt to uh, to manipulate or to... Uh, we don't know, we don't know. And I think that was difficult for me. I tried to tell the book, uh, the story from my perspective. And I, sometimes I, I also said that we don't know. Yes. We don't know if, 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 it, uh, if, if it was linked or not. Yeah. And there is a great chapter where you talk about, uh, it's in relation to Cloudy and what's her name, but you describe the sort of blurring between myth and reality mm -hmm. and uh, the whole issue around his qualifications. But that idea of where the line between myth and fact, mm -hmm. you know, lies comes quite strongly through in that. Karen, for you, talking about people following you around, 
Um, what's been the hardest element of, of writing this book? Definitely not knowing who to trust as a journalist. We go by the rule, don't trust anyone. But it was very difficult sort of navigating, can I ask this cop this question? And if I do, will it end up with that suspect who now knows what I'm looking into? And then just the constant flinching because while prior to writing it and while writing it, there were so many weird incidents. So firstly, I was photographed in a hotel while I was photographing a crime suspect. So how the, they must have spotted me photographing who they are, must be people linked to him. Then the second thing was a death threat. Um, when looking into the National Gun Smuggling Investigation, which came as a surprise because I used court documents which are in the public domain. And then I've got two cell phones. Calls would come through to the second cell phone. I'd answer it and once there was a man's voice and then I'd call the number back because it is a contact of mine and the person hadn't actually phoned me. They said they hadn't phoned me. And then we had a an alleged informant go on Facebook saying I accepted 48,000 rand from the mayor of Cape Town, the current mayor, that's totally false. And now it's becoming a lot more personal, like it's almost like they're going through a checklist. So like I was telling Edwin earlier, on Tuesday I got a phone call, this time they're definitely attacking me as a woman. No, no physical threats, but with the intention to humiliate me, because I'm continuing to look into some, well, same theme, same people. So it's that constant of oh, what, what next? What yeah. comes next? And I think that's just a reminder of as, as gripping as the book is, it's, it is fact, it's not fiction. And the courage that it takes, perhaps particularly as, as a journalist on the ground, covering these events, going to the court cases, the stakes are high. And I think in many ways the stakes are high in all of your books because politics is very dirty. Yeah. <laughs> um, on 